Hey everybody, my name is Paul Esden Jr., a.k.a. Boy Green. I'm the New York Jets digital reporter for Heavy.com. Welcome to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash boygreen25. And boy, we've got a very special guest here on the show, uh, one of my favorites. This is an absolute honor to have him on, so let's waste no more time here on a Mock Draft Monday, and let's bring him in. His name is Mike Tannenbaum, legend. Bow down to him again, long time. Former Jets general manager joining us and current ESPN NFL insider. Let's bring him in. Mike, how are you? Great. Good to be with you, Paul. Well, uh, Mike, uh, let's dive right in because the draft is ever approaching here, uh, just right around the corner. And I think one of the big things people wonder about are those draft day deals. And I want to ask you, Mike, as a guy who's uh, thrown a couple of those together, how do those come to fruition? Do you have to lay the groundwork ahead of time? And how ahead of time actually is it? Yeah, great question. It, it all depends not on a one-size-fits-all approach. When we trade for Darrell Revis, we had an agreement in principle the night before with the Carolina Panthers. Um, they're, they had a longtime GM, Marty Herney, who I done a lot of deals with, think the world of, and have a lot of trust with. So we um, kind of reached agreement in principle and um, we're able to say that, hey, we want to go to 21 to 14 if one player was there and this is what we would be comfortable with and we're not going to try to do it for less and we don't want you to ask for more at that moment. And there was two other corners that we liked that year, uh, Leon Hall and Aaron Ross, and we were able to get uh, Darrell, and that one worked out. Other times, it's spur of the moment, um, unexpected opportunities, or you get a phone call that you just can't say no to. And when you're trading up and laying the groundwork, do you have to tell the other team anything, or can you be like, hey, we're just moving up for a player, and do they press say, well, who is it? Because we want to know if we're trading back. Do you have to give up that kind of intel? You know, it depends. Um, that's contextual. Like, if it's a spot or two, they may say, hey, what side of the ball are you going to? Um, it, that all depends. Um, you know, some teams handle that uh, slightly different than others. Okay. Uh, let's. You brought up Revis. I was going to save this for a little bit later in the interview, but I asked the question to Damian Woody when he joined me a couple of weeks ago. Of course, Darrell Revis is eligible for the Pro Football Hall of Fame in 2023, and I might as well ask the guy who drafted him, is he a first ballot Hall of Famer, Mike? Oh, no question about it. I mean, he was so incredibly valuable. You know, sometimes, not to get too into the details of coverages, but a lot of times you will see a team's best corner defend the other team's second best receiver and then take the their, that other team's best receiver and double team them. We did the opposite with Darrell. We actually um, put him man-to-man -man on the other team's best receiver, and that just made the other 10 players valuable. So, you know, you can always debate statistics and things like that. Well, well, beyond that, Paul, would be like the impact he had on the team and how he made everybody else so much more valuable. And uh, let me ask you this, because it seems like everyone is trying to find the next Darrell Revis and the next shutdown lockdown corner. Will there ever be another player like Darrell Revis ever again? Yeah. I mean, look, I think Sauce Gardner is going to be a really good player in this year's draft. I actually, physically, he reminds me more of Cromarty than Revis because of his length. But, you know, Darrell's a really, really good player, obviously, for a long time, and I think um, he's rare, but there'll be other really good players that come down the pike. What do you make of uh, Derek Stingley? He's the other corner. A lot of people are pretty high on. Yeah, that's a tougher one for me. I just, I'm a big believer in durability and consistency and he doesn't have that. And that's not to say he won't be a really good player, but that would be my concern. How do you weigh risk when we're when we're talking draft and you're weighing things, uh, even go back to your seat as the general manager of the Jets, when you're weigh, weighing injury risk, character concerns, and things of that nature, how did you handle that on a prospect-to-prospect -prospect basis? I would You try to assess whether or not you try to project to the next level and say, is this habitual or aberrational? And does he have a platform physically to be able to, you know, withstand the rigors of an NFL season and you want to look at him physically, you want to see what the injuries were. Are they soft tissue? Um, you, you try to dig as deep as you possibly can. And with the character concern, how deep do you guys go to investigate something? Is it draft day style? How many people were at his 21st birthday sort of thing with Bo Callahan or, or how far does it really go on those kinds of things? Yeah. You know, my, my belief has always been true characters. I treat people that can't help you. So, I want to talk to the academic advisor. I want to talk to the trainer, the equipment guy, because I think that's really who players are from an intangible standpoint. 
And uh, do you still get to get that fire, that uh, that thirst of yours quenched? Because, again, you were at the head of the operation pulling the trigger for the New York Jets, and now at ESPN you're kind of getting the other side of that and getting to do the media side. Is that fire still burning when you get to do that on the other side for the media side of things? Yeah, you know, I just try to be the best version of myself and challenge myself. You know, I'm so lucky, Paul. I'm, count, I'm, I'm the point person on the national ESPN radio broadcast, so it's an awesome responsibility. And one that I got to know this draft really well because I'm going to be on, you know, carrying the draft with, you know, a few others on, on the national radio and a lot of people listen to it. So I better be ready to roll. So um, I spent a lot of time watching tape, um, run simulated scouting meetings. Uh, I run an organization called the 33rd team and we have coaches that are between opportunities and we, we have incredible draft meetings. You know, we just had Wade Phillips and Rick Spielman and a whole bunch of others and, we literally simulate what it would be like with a team and because of technology with Zoom, um, I feel like from that standpoint, like our meetings are really rock solid. What is your day-to-day operations uh, looking like now from morning till night? Uh, you know, mixing in tape, your job at ESPN, the 33rd team, which does wonderful work as well. Yeah, that's about right. And then uh, I teach a class in the fall at Columbia um, where we uh, talk about the business of the NFL and strategic planning from – salary cap resources to collective bargaining to evaluations to sponsorships and sales so um that's been a great opportunity as well one that i've really enjoyed again we're sugar mike tannenbaum former jets general manager here on the show make sure you guys like the video and hit subscribe of course follow uh, mike tannenbaum on twitter at real tannenbaum uh, on twitter as i uh, just mentioned there uh, let's get into some jet specific topics mike if you were running the operation you were back in the gm chair would it tickle your fancy to potentially take an offensive lineman at four or 10 in this draft? Yeah. You know, like in fairness, I don't want to say exactly what I would do because I don't want to come across second guessing anybody sure, else. Sure. A lot of respect for the people that are sitting in that seat. So I do think they've earned the right to get two really good players. Uh, you know, obviously they made a trade with Jamal Adams that now gives them, you know, two top 10 picks. And I would think given this year's draft ball, they should come out of this with two really good players. And let me ask you this, because this is the big pivot point that we're all talking about on social media. If the Jets were to take an offensive line with four or ten, there's only two offensive tackle spots, and then there would be three guys that would be up for those spots. Competition's always good. But would that seem to lean towards perhaps a move to a move and that they would have to then trade George Fant or Mekhi Becton in your mind? I like to have depth at key positions, so I'd be hard-pressed to understand why they would make that trade. You know, it's a little bit like we've talked a lot this offseason about Jimmy Garoppolo. Yep. I'm hard-pressed to understand why they would trade Jimmy Garoppolo. He's a really good player. San Francisco has a great team. Like, why Why would you trade him? You know, likewise, if I'm the Jets, let's say they take, you know, Iki Iquanu or sure. Evan Neal. Hey, why not have three tackles? You know, I'm hard-pressed to think why that's not good for your team. So, um, I think take the best player, make your team better, make him more competitive. You need depth. You know, again, we're talking about 17 game seasons. Um, you want to protect, protect Zach Wilson. He's everything. So um, that's something I would really keen on. And how proud were you to finally see it was such a kind of, I mean, it was just a big gap of time, basically, from when you double dipped in the draft with Old Brick and uh, Mangold, of course, to when the Jets finally ended that drought uh, in 2020 with Joe Douglas. And now we got kind of a streak going on here with Mekhi Becton, Elijah Tucker, and hell, maybe even a third year in a row. Uh, how proud were you to finally see that end and the Jets investing in the trenches where it belongs? Yeah, well, it started with my first draft, Paul. You know, show me a good offensive line, I'll show you a playoff team. Now, there's an exception to that. This year, Cincinnati Bengals, but more times than not, the teams that are really good up front on both sides of the ball have consistent success. And to me, you can do it without it, but it's so much harder. It's hard to win on the road. It's hard to win on third down. Um, if you can't protect, move people off the ball on third and short, where when you're going to run and they know you're going to run, it's just not have. It's really hard to have sustainability. By the way, Mike, do you stay in touch with any of the, those draft picks of yours? They worked out pretty well with the Jets and in the NFL in general. Do you guys uh, stay in touch? I do. Uh, you know, Paul, we, we had a lot of success. We had a great run. And, you know, it's funny, like, talking about those scouting calls. So we, we were doing, like, receivers the other day. Mm -hmm. And on the call was Lavernius Coles and Kyle Wilson. And, um, you know, I talked to a lot of guys, you know, uh, Tony Richardson, Curtis Martin, Damian Woody, uh, some, you know, through social, and I'm so proud of, like, the men they've become. Not surprised at all, given the character 
that they played with. You know, so many guys, Chad Payton, like he came to see us in Miami, Vinny, just on and on and on of, you know, just one great guy after the next and so happy and proud to see so many guys do, you know, meaningful things post-playing career. And by the way, speaking of that, you know, how is it weighing that character concern potentially in the draft? Because sometimes guys are super talented and you need super talented players to win. But at the same time, you also have to have a good culture and locker room. So how do you balance those things and, and again, decide whether you just want a clean bill of health and, and other guys will be removed from the board entirely or whether or not you're willing to risk it to get the biscuit? Yeah, that's um, it's hard to answer. It, context is everything. You know, great player. I always say this, like, in every – NFL teams front office is one mathematical qu- uh, equation. Production equals tolerance. And uh, when Jimmy Johnson took over the Miami Dolphins in his first team meeting, he said, you know, to the backup corner, if you fall asleep in this meeting, I'm going to cut you. He said to Dan Marino, if you fall asleep in this meeting, I'm going to wake you up. So <laughs> that, you know, that there's a lot of wisdom in that for all of us. Right. And yeah. the more you produce, the more of the benefit of the doubt you get. So, um, yeah, if you're Dan Marino, you can fall asleep. If you're the backup corner, we're going to let you go. And That's a great story. Look, yeah, so the better you are, the more the bumps in the road that will be tolerated. It's just life. And, and do you sense a trend here? Speaking of that, Joe Douglas in his first two drafts, Mekhi Becton, he swung for the fences, high upside guy. And then last year, Zach Wilson, high upside guy. He was swinging for the fences. Is there a trend here? And perhaps is he maybe more willing to risk it than maybe some other general managers? And maybe that's a, a, a trait or something he looks for. Yeah, that's interesting. I haven't thought of it that way. We'll see how it plays out. You know, uh, look, Zach Wilson has a chance to be a really good quarterback. You know, we'll see. You know, it's a great event complete, as, as it should be for most quarterbacks. You know, Becton's a guy that, look, has immense physical attributes. I mean, that's clear. Um, you just hope that the love of the game and the consistency will be there for sure. Um, and Wilson, like, this is a consequential year for him. You know, I, I, I thought his press conferences actually got better um, going from trying to understand, like, instead of trying to be like Aaron Rodgers, just go be – Zach Wilson, like, just make first downs. You know, Coach Parcells always talked about, hey, you know, we're in the business of making first downs, not touchdowns. Like, let's just stack one good first down top of the next. We're going to get to where we want to go. We don't need anybody to hit home runs. And, of course, you want to take them when they're there. But I thought he sort of understood the magnitude of the job and the responsibility of the job uh, as he grew into the season. And you know, that's just true of, you know, most rookie quarterbacks. And Mike, you mentioned this earlier about the you know having players that want that love football. Quite frankly, Robert Sala has mentioned that several times. Is something that he looks for. How do you determine whether or not a prospect, in fact, loves football or does not? And uh, how do you kind of figure that out during the draft process? Um, you, you really again, I think you want to talk to people around them and see if if you took football away, what would it look like? And um, ironically, Jimmy Johnson, when he was with the Dallas Cowboys, he talked about it. He wanted people with no parachutes. And what he meant by that was that if you took football away from them, would they have abject poverty? And those are the players that did whatever it took to, to make it. Um, Rex Ryan had another really good expression, Paul, which was um, we're going to try to win and compete a championship or die trying. And we want players and people in the building that are going to be the first ones in last to live, leave, and uh, play with their hair on fire and just, again, try to win a championship or die trying. Mike, uh, the Jets have not been able to get to the playoffs, uh, quite frankly, since you were there. So I have no other choice but to ask, how do they get back there? Oh, come on. You know, Paul, like running a team, it's like a candle and win. You know, you could buy a Yankee candle and, you know, <laughs> just, you know, the wins and losses come and go. And um, look, they have a good plan. It's clear that, you know, Robert Sala and, and Joe Douglas are tied to the hip and have a good understanding of how they want to build a team. And, um, again, philosophically for me, I want to build in the trenches. But um, I think they've had some meaningful pieces this offseason. And, you know, hopefully uh, they show meaningful improvement during the year. Mike, what's your philosophy on disappointing players? For instance, a player I will bring up is Denzel Mims as an example. First year showed some pops that were intriguing. Second year disappointing for a lot of reasons, uh, both in his control and outside his control. And now a lot of people have speculated perhaps it's time to trade him for peanuts and and just lose him for nothing. What's your philosophy? You just buy into the guy and say, hey, I'm not going to give him away for a bag of beans here. We invested a second round pick and we're going to, you know, see this process through as opposed to hitting the eject button. Yeah, I I would tell him, like, look, you know, Denzel, we invested a second-round pick in you, and we believed in you then, and here's the roadmap for you to get better. Like, 
we're not interested in you like with your iPhone, your iPod, carrying that around. We're interested in you in playing football, and here's the plan to get better. So mm. I would be much more concerned about investing in him, much more so than trying to, as you said, just give him away because they did invest a lot. But I would have a detailed roadmap on how he could get there. Okay, uh, just a few more here before we get him out of here. Again, Mike Tannenbaum uh, is joining us, which is, again, i got to pinch myself. It's Mike freaking Tannenbaum here, uh, former Jets general manager uh, here on the show. And, uh, Mike, uh, I guess the next natural progression here is we're, we're talking about this and, and looking ahead uh, to this NFL draft. I mean, this is an opportunity to have a foundational draft, and you may know a thing or two about having a couple of those uh, for the New York Jets. So I guess to ask that question, how do you have a foundational draft? How are you able to do that? Because one thing is having the picks, and the Jets have the opportunity, but of course you have to execute on that for it to be able to uh, withstand. Yeah, I think you're looking for players that have a high floor and a high ceiling. What I mean by that is, like, football characters, the tape sets the floor and the character sets the ceiling. Like, do they, you know, love football and would be playing football? And, you know, when you think about, like, where's great football play from? It's usually, like, east of the Mississippi River, right, in the SEC. So, yeah. like, to me, like you get those SEC players, you get Big Ten schools, and you know there's a great axiom that George Young, the late great GM of the Giants, used to say, like get great players from great schools and ask them to do exactly what they did in college. And more times than not, that'll work out. Like and you look at the ones that we hit on, like David Harris, Darrell Rivas, DeBrickashaw, Mangold, Leon Washington, Brad Smith. Um, there's a lot of them, fortunately. And and, yeah. and and what it came back to was like. We asked them to do exactly what they did, even like Mo Wilkerson. Like, they were good players in good schools, and we had a very, like, like the vision was easy. It was plain to see, like, them coming into our system, the vision was uh, really aligned. And, uh, and inverse, Paul, like, look, we had our fair share of mistakes, and those were times where we got away from what George Young talked a lot about. And George Young, by the way, influenced Coach Parcells' player personnel philosophy as well. And that doesn't mean you can't take a, a chance or a projection or a position change, but there's a time and place to do that. So if you're wrong, it's not consequential. All right, Mike, final one before we get you out of here. Let me ask you. I think a lot of Jet fans, quite frankly, have this question in mind. Let's throw you back in that GM chair, and you will pick for the New York Jets here. We'll do a little mini version of a mock draft here. If Mike Tannenbaum was on the show, or, or it really running the operation, where would he go uh, before we get you out of here? So I guess let's start at the number four overall pick. Again, uh, just players you believe that will be there based on all your tape study and all your watchings and conversations. Let's start off with the number four overall pick. Where would Mike Tannenbaum go? Well, I would just say this generally, Paul. Like, if we were running a team and we yeah. owned it, we wanted a player for the next 10 years, I, I really would probably take Jamison Williams. And here's why. He's coming off of an ACL but uh, my son, Jacob, and I, we were scouting the SEC championship game in Atlanta. And I went into the stadium, couldn't wait to see the Georgia defense. And I left saying, like, Jamison Williams is Tyreek Hill. There was one touchdown on an in-cut ball where he outran leverage. And that's really hard to do. Like, because when you're going against a Georgia defense or an NFL defense, when you have angles on a player, that typically will, you know, end the play. And his play speed, to me, is so explosive. So... I'm super intrigued. Now, in my ESPN mock, I mocked Garrett Wilson to the Jets, who I think is going to be really, really good. And to me, he's a B plus, A minus. You're buying Amazon stock. Like, you're not going to go wrong. Yeah. But I think if we look back in five years, if you and I were having this conversation, we said, hey, who's the best receiver from the 2022 draft? I think, in my opinion, long term, it'll be Jameis Williams. Okay, and final one, uh, looking at another player. Who would you pair with him in the first round? There's a lot of talented players and a lot of needs for the Jets. Yeah, player we talked about, guy I love, guy that didn't give up a touchdown this year, Sauce Gardner. You know, if he was there at 10, I'd race to turn in the card. He's one of my favorite players of the draft because he reminds me of Cromartie. He's long. He could turn the ball over. Didn't give up a touchdown. Um, if you want to play man-to-man -man and get off the field on third down, like Sauce Gardner is a great place to start. Mike, I want to say it's an honor. I am absolutely humbled to have been joined by you here on the show. Thanks for taking the time. You do great work for the 33rd team, of course, and on ESPN. We love seeing on television again. Among Jet fans, you're the best, baby. We love you. We'll, we'll always remember you, Mal. All right.